Hi, welcome. This is the Chapter 9 video review. We're going to be looking at glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, which includes the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. So before we can look at these pathways in cellular respiration, we have to understand a basic type of chemical reaction that occurs during these processes. And, it, and these chemical reactions are called redox reactions. And what happens in redox reactions are bonds are broken or rearranged. And when we do this to these bonds, um, electrons are lost. And they have to go somewhere. So what happens is something is oxidized. And that means it loses electrons. And the electrons don't disappear, they go somewhere. And another molecule grabs them and it is reduced. So we have a saying for redox reactions called oil rig. Okay? Oil means oxidation is loss of electrons and rig means reduction is gain. So let's look at an example. Here's a molecule called methane. Okay? Methane is in a form that has electrons to lose. So it has electrons, it's reduced. It has gained electrons already. As it loses electrons, and methane is natural gas, and in the presence of oxygen, it can burn, and it can be completely oxidized down to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a more oxidized state, and it's lower energy. Methane has reduced and has lots of energy. And what's happening during this process is these bonds are rearranged, electrons are given off. Where do they go? They go to oxygen. So to burn methane, you need oxygen because it grabs electrons, oxidation, I mean, oxygen is reduced, it ex grabs electrons. If you think about it, if you have a candle, if it's burning, you need oxygen. If you put a lid on it, it'll stop burning. Now let's think about this in terms of cellular respiration. We have sugar here, the C6H12O6, it's also reduced, so similar to methane. And what happens in the presence of oxygen, it's oxidized, okay? And what do we create? We create CO2, which is um, our waste product, and then water, but also lots of energy. So we know when you break down sugar, it makes energy. That makes sense. Now, if you think about it, sugar will burn in the presence of oxygen. So let's look at this little video. Watch what happens. There's a burner. Sugar will be thrown on it. Let's see what happens. Oh, it burns. So real quick, flame was given off lots of heat. So that means sugar has lots of energy in it. Okay. Now that was all in one step and the energy was all released at once and created a flame. Now that's too hot. So what we need is several steps to slowly extract the energy, and that's what happens during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Now, when we break down glucose and its intermediates, some of the reactions are redox reactions and electrons are lost. So when some of the intermediates of these pathways are, go through these reactions, they lose electrons. So here, AH is going to lose electrons and become just A. But those electrons aren't lost. They're grabbed by electron carriers. So we have NAD+, which will grab electrons. And then we, when it does grab electrons, it becomes NADH. So here's NAD+. It's going to grab electrons, which means it's reduced. Remember, reduction is gain, and it becomes NADH. It takes those electrons over here to the electron transport chain, ETC, electron transport chain. Drops them off, and then it's ready to go back to glycolysis and go back, back to the Krebs cycle to pick up more. So we have NAD+, plus, that's ready to accept electrons. It becomes NADH which has electrons, and then we have FAD+, which is ready to accept electrons, and then FADH, which has accepted. So remember, when they accept electrons, they're reduced. Reduction is gain of electrons. Okay, so here's the steps that we're going to go over today in aerobic respiration. Aerobic because uh, oxygen is required. These are the steps, one, two, three, four. They go in this order, glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, then the respiratory chain, electron transport chain. Okay, And it turns out these all go together. They go in this order, so it's very important to remember. And the products, steps one, two, and three, they create just a little bit of ATP, but they create lots of electron carriers, NADH, FADH2, okay, that are all going to come to the electron transport chain and drop off their electrons. That's where we're going to make lots and lots of ATP. Okay, so that's what we're trying to shoot for. Lots of ATP in the electron transport chain. So here's the first step, glycolysis. And if you look at our diagram over here, these are the steps we're going to go through when we're focusing on glycolysis. At the bottom, it tells us what step we're on, the location in the cell, what we start with, and what we end with. So for glycolysis, what's important is there's 10 overall reactions, but what happens is we can break it into two phases. There's energy investment phase, where we actually use two ATPs. 
So we take phosphates off of ATP and we add them to the glucose. It's actually increasing the energy. And then we split the glucose into two three carbon molecules for the second phase of glycolysis. So if we look at glycolysis, we start with glucose, which has six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we split it into two three carbon molecules. Okay. Now what happens is the second phase called energy production stage. Here we actually produce four ATP, so it's energy production. We also create more electron carriers, or some electron carriers, NADH and FADH2. Okay, so that means during this phase there's a redox reaction. NADH gra NAD plus grabs electrons and becomes NADH. Okay, that's important. NADH is an important end product of glycolysis. It's going to go to the electron transport chain, ETC. Now let's look at this process. We make ATP here. Okay, on this side we create two, on this side we create two, so overall we create four, but we use two up here already, so our net production of ATP is only two ATPs. So if you look at our bottom, our end products are two total net ATPs. Now this process here is called substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate, okay, this name tells you what happens. A substrate, you should think of enzymes. So what's happening here is an enzyme is taking a phosphate off the intermediates in glycolysis and adding it to the ADP to create an ATP. When you add a phosphate to something, it's called phosphorylation. When an enzyme does it in this process, it's called substrate level phosphorylation. Now that's something important to keep straight because later we're going to see oxidative phosphorylation, which is a type of way to create ATP, but in the presence of oxygen. So overall, what did we create in glycolysis? Two pyruvates, one, two, two ATPs, and two electron carriers, NADHs. All right, so this graph here shows us the amount of energy on the uh, Y and the steps going across um, on the X here. So initially we start with glucose. It has a certain amount of energy that we can um, extract from it. But during glycolysis, we actually are increasing the energy by using ATP. It adds phosphate and the energy level actually goes up. So we're increasing it. Then during the energy um, releasing phase, we see a drop. Okay, so here's a sharp drop. And then that energy is released during a redox reaction and we create NADH. Okay, it stores those in it, the energy from there and it's going to go to the electron transport chain, drop it off and make lots of ATP. Okay, and then we continued through the rest of the steps of glycolysis and we ended with pyruvate. Now if you note, here's pyruvate, it still has some energy left. If you look at the scale, we still have a long way to go until we get to the bottom. So we have to continue extracting energy from the pyruvate. And that's the next step. The next step, we did glycolysis, we ended with pyruvate, now we're looking at pyruvate oxidation. The name tells you what's going to happen. Pyruvate is going to be oxidized. So if pyruvate is oxidized, it loses electrons. Where do those electrons go? NADH. Okay, NAD plus grabs the electrons, so it's reduced, right? Reduction is gain, and it becomes NADH. So one of the byproducts, or one of the products of pyruvate oxidation is NADH. Okay, if you look at pyruvate, it also has one, two, three carbons. The end product is acetyl-CoA, and right here it has one, two carbons in the central part. It means we lost one. Where'd it go? CO2. So one of the CO2s produced here, the carbon originated in the pyruvate, which originated in the glucose. Okay, so we literally exhale carbon dioxide from the sugar we were eating. So pyruvate oxidation is pretty straightforward. It occurs inside the mitochondria and the cytoplasm in the mitochondria in eukaryotes. It occurs in the cytoplasm of prokaryotes. Produces two acetyl-CoA's, two NADH's, which are good because they'll go to the electron transport chain, and then two carbon dioxides. All right, so if we look, we ended with acetyl-CoA, so what do you think citric acid cycle will start with? It's going to start with the end products of pyruvate oxidation, which is acetyl-CoA. All right, so let's take a look at our energy extraction graph. So far, we started with glucose, and now we've dropped all the way down here to acetyl-CoA. So we've lost energy. Here you see another big loss. That's during the redox reaction when we created NADH. Remember, NADH is so important because it's storing these electrons, potential energy. It's going to go to the electron transport chain and drop those off so we can make lots of ATP. But let's see where acetyl-CoA is. It's not at the bottom yet, so we still got more energy to extract. So let's see what happens with acetyl-CoA. Well, acetyl-CoA enters citric acid cycle. Okay, this is also sometimes called the Krebs cycle. So if we look at our graph over here, 
And by the way, this is, again, we're still in the mitochondrial matrix in eukaryotes and the cytoplasm of prokaryotes. So here's acetyl-CoA. Here's the two carbons from our original glucose, okay, that were converted into pyruvate and then into acetyl-CoA. As this enters the Krebs cycle, we have some important reaction occur. All right. We have a redox reaction, which means we're going to lose electrons. NAD plus is going to grab them, and right here we create three NADHs. Okay. Over here, the two carbons in acetyl-CoA that we started with, two of the carbons from our original glucose are lost as two carbon dioxides. Okay, so they're ex uh, expelled and we exhale those. At this point, all the carbons we started with in glucose have been lost as carbon dioxide. Another thing we create is another redox reaction. We create another electron carrier. In this case, FAD grabs electrons, becomes FADH2. Okay, that's going to also go to the electron transport chain. And here you notice we create ATP this time, but just a little bit. Now what we need to consider is that this whole process is happening twice. Because it, during glycolysis, we split our glucose into two, and we ended with two pyruvates. So here's one of the pyruvates. It's going to enter this cycle and go through it. But our other pyruvate is going to enter another Krebs cycle all by itself, okay? And it's going to go through the Krebs cycle and make all these products. So when we have two CO2s here, we also have two in this one, okay? And same for all the electron carriers. So if we sum up all our end products, we have six NADHs and two FADH2s. These are really important because that's going to be a lot of energy we can create in the electron transport chain. We create a little bit of ATP, not much. And in the Krebs cycle, we can say all the CO2 has been created. So our sugar we started with has been completely oxidized and released as carbon dioxide. So remember, the sugar is really reduced. As we break it down, it gives off electrons and becomes CO2. All right, so at this point, we, during the Krebs cycle, we started with acetyl-CoA and we finished all the way down to the bottom. We extracted all the energy out. So look at all these electron carriers we have, all these NADHs. So here's, here's two, here's four, here's six, eight, 10, okay? And then here's the FADH2s that we created. All of these are going to go off and meet us in the next step, which is the electron transport chain, ETC. So let's take a look. Here's the electron transport chain, the last step. We've done glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the citric acid cycle. The end products of all these merge at the electron transport chain. So where are we? This is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So if we look at this diagram, which oftentimes can be overwhelming, we have the inner mitochondrial membrane here and the outer mitochondrial membrane here. Right? This is why the inner membrane has all the folds, because it allows more of these reactions to take place. It increases the surface area, and we can create a lot more ATP. So what happens during this electron transport is the NADH from glycolysis from pyruvate oxidation from the citric acid cycle shows up and here it is and when it gets here it drops off its electrons okay so it loses its electrons so oxidation is lost it loses electrons becomes NAD plus this NAD plus is then free to go back to the Krebs cycle or um, glycolysis to get more electrons and then it'll bring them back to the electron transport chain here's FADH2 it's going to drop off its electrons Okay, now let's see what happens to the electrons. This blue line here in the center shows us the flow of electrons. They're gonna flow through this electron transport chain. Okay, they go from inner, uh, a level of high energy to low energy. Okay, these are protein complexes, uh, mostly, that are embedded in the inner membrane. And so we can think of this as a river. So as water moves down a river, we can harness that energy to, to make electricity. So if you think of a dam, water's flowing through that dam and it turns a turbine and it makes energy. So here we have electrons flowing through the electron transport chain and we harness this energy to pump hydrogen ions out into this inner membrane space. Okay, these are hydrogen ions, sometimes they're called protons. Okay, so these protons or these hydrogen ions accumulate and this is the type of active transport. We're actively pumping them out and creating a high concentration in the inner membrane space. Okay, that's electron transport. The next phase is called chemiosmosis. So as all these hydrogen ions build up, we have a um, gradient, lots of ions outside, less inside. We also have a charge imbalance. There's lots of positive charges outside. So what happens is they're gonna to wanna to flow back into the cell. And when they do, they pass, they pass in through diffusion and they turn 
this molecule complex. It's called ATP synthase. And when this turns, it creates ATP. Now what's important here is this occurred in the presence of oxygen. Okay, since it occurs in the presence of oxygen, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so that's what we're talking about when we say oxidative phosphorylation. ADP is going to be phosphorylized, okay, a phosphate is going to be added, and it's going to create ATP. So this whole electron transport chain, the electrons are flowing through it, and they end up at oxygen. Oxygen is what we call the terminal electron acceptor. When it grabs the electrons, it gains electrons, so it's reduced, right? Reduction is gain, and it becomes water, one of our um, byproducts of um, oxidative phosphorylation. As these hydrogen ions or these protons flow back in through ATP synthase, we create ATP. And so this whole process is called oxidative phosphorylation. It requires the electron transport chain and ATP synthesis. So if we review the electron transport chain, the electron carriers show up, they drop off their electrons. Electrons flow through as we pump hydrogen ions out. We create a gradient of um, hydrogen ions or protons. This is called, by the way, proton motive force. All right, so the proton motive force is a force created by all these protons outside. Proton motive force. When these hydrogen ions flow back in, we create ATP. And that's the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. All right, so you can see why we need oxygen when we breathe, because it drives our electron transport chain, which is where we make our ATP. Now the other important thing here is we make 28 ATPs. This is a lot. All the previous steps didn't make very much ATP. Now we made 28 total. So what I would recommend is you take a look at this um, figure on the left and you fill in this table by yourself. If you can do that, then you understand the cellular respiration.